the Great Valley. Ah! The Land Before Time Dinosaurs in animation are not uncommon, but very few have their fame to be found on the same level as Littlefoot and his friends. Created from the combined forces of Don Bluth, Steven Spielberg, and George Lucas, not only did this emotional tale went on to become one of Bluth's most notable works alongside An American Tale, The Secret of Nim, and Anastasia, but this was once considered one of the champions of home media. Sure, it did do well on its initial theatrical release, but when this movie came out on VHS, it was the biggest cause to why many 80s and 90s kids have the Land Before Time present in their childhood. Not to mention that it went on to become a small franchise that spawned 13 sequels and a TV show? Who the frigid little foot have so many sequels? You'd think after a long path to the Great Valley, they'd retire from adventuring and just eat leaves or something. Not wander around aimlessly to randomly find more trouble and sing songs about it. Friends for dinner. not here to talk about the sequels yet. This is all about the original. The one that started this journey. The one that is not a musical, which makes me wonder why the sequels established that tradition when it was never a tradition in the first place. So now that we're looking all the way back to one of the biggest migrations, does this adventure still hold up after all this time? Or are there better trips to take than to the Great Valley? Let's find out. The Story When Bluth and Spielberg were brainstorming the idea for their next feature after an American tale, they thought about making a dinosaur version of Bambi. Even in the final film, that original concept still shines through as a quick way to describe the picture. Much like the Disney film, The Land Before Time is the story about these children experiencing life and learning firsthand about both the blessings and the hardships that it has to offer. Maybe this is not entirely like Bambi, since the main plot is about the little dinosaurs banding together in order to reach a land known as the Great Valley, yet some of the same themes are still present to give valuable lessons to his audience, including death, friendship, looking with your heart, and a subtle commentary against segregation and racism. Because we're different. It's always been that way. Well, why? <laughs> oh, don't worry so much. If there is one word to describe this, it's that this is a simple movie. Even with its strong themes, this is not the kind of picture that's asking its audience to think a lot. For the most part, the plot is just a handful of characters trying to go from point A to point B, and there wasn't much room to develop the concept further than that, especially when the running time is just under 70 minutes with the credits and Bluth was restricted to the demands of the executives and Spielberg and Lucas. That's why there can be times when it presents some noticeable adjustments that were beyond the team's creative control, feeling like they've dumbed down the movie to make it more appealing to younger children. Sure, some won't mind this juvenile approach, but there is a part of me that feels like it holds it back a little from letting the feature show its true potential. I bite. However, there are some upsides to its simplicity too, and these factors do help improve the viewing experience and make up for its setbacks. One element that works with the simplicity is how it enhances the world building. The way that it describes everything is all reduced to their one basic attribute, completely rejecting the names that people associate with these creatures and the elements in the environment and call them as the easiest way to identify them. After all, this is the land before time, so it makes sense that this is set before any scientific terms were created. The bright circle must pass over us many times and we must follow it each day to where it touches the ground. But while the narrative itself does not deliver a lot, it allowed the filmmakers to give priority to the emotional core. What it lacks in story, it gains in heart to make the movie as engaging as possible. 
making sure that the action scenes that put the kids in peril are extremely intense, and that the tender moments are very heartfelt to help the viewer connect more with the characters. And on top of the strong directing from Don Bluth to make sure those scenes work effectively, another key helper in those moments is composer James Horner, whose beautiful score is a significant driving force to really emphasize the mood. Maybe the story itself doesn't necessarily offer plenty, but thanks to its powerful heart, clever world building, and important themes, The Land Before Time proves that even something simple can deliver a lot. The Animation As I said before, despite dinosaurs being commonplace in animation, The Land Before Time is one of the very few that is admired for its depiction of them. Sure, there are others that have a legendary status in their own right, but you'll never see anyone praise the Flintstones for its scientific accuracy. I mean, I don't think any paleontologist will tell you, Ah yes, I admire how they distinctly capture their forgotten nature of looking at the camera and say, it's a living. But at the time, this movie was a completely different story. And by the way, keep in mind that I said, at the time. I am aware that what we've recently discovered about what dinosaurs look like is totally different than what we've seen in this film or in Jurassic Park, but that's not what this review is about. Anyways, a great way to describe The Land Before Time's animation is that this is a throwback to the Rite of Spring segment from Walt Disney's Fantasia, as the heavy amount of research put into bringing these dinosaurs to life really shows. Not only taking inspiration from the fossils and paleo art that presented how they were during their prime, but also looking upon footage of real animals to convincingly portray that these were once creatures that roamed the same earth that we live in. Rather it be capturing their grand scale with the movements of elephants and giraffes, or even those of smaller scale for the younger characters like goats when they butt heads. Some of the young seem born without fear. Along with the research, there was also the fact that Bluth had an incredibly talented team who were more than capable of accomplishing the task at hand. Even when they were just moving into their new studio in Dublin, Ireland, that didn't stop their craftsmanship in order to present the character's perilous journey in a very smooth and fluent way. They were even so good at what they do that there are some shots where they were kind of showing off what they could do with their drawings, sometimes putting the characters in intricate angles to present the dinosaurs and their situations in different ways to find the best effect. <laughs> but of course, their goal wasn't to present them as realistic as possible. They still needed to make room to have these animated characters be, well, animated characters. This is where the visuals play a significant part as much as the score in the emotional core. Along with the prehistoric appearance, their expressions are meant to be easily readable as possible, never hiding how they feel and proudly displaying their personalities, allowing the mood to leave a stronger impact to the audience. This also works greatly on the action scenes. Much like in real life, the dangers they face can happen in a snap, and when they show up, the pacing gets an immediate rush and takes advantage of the film's large scale to highlight the risks in contrast to the children's size. Not to mention how it makes the most out of the effects to present how the environment is an essential part of the action that could also be a serious obstacle for the cast. From being stuck in the middle of an earth shake, to running away from the jaws of a sharp tooth. With its natural depiction of the prehistoric world, it's another example of the master craftsmanship of Don Bluth and his team. The Characters Here's an interesting trivia about the film. Originally, the dinosaurs were not supposed to talk at all. In fact, they wanted to make something that would be like a feature-length version of Fantasia's The Rite of Spring. However, it was later decided that they wanted kids to be their main target audience and eventually added the voice actors. This original vision is notable at the start of the movie, 
where you don't see anyone talking on screen with their mouths moving to make the words until around seven and a half minutes in. Now, you be careful, my little foot. <laughs> with that said, as it supplies simple writing with a short running time, this is not the kind of picture where you'd find complex characters. Yes, they have their own personalities, but the film doesn't have time to flesh them out individually to present their depth. And instead, they are as easily describable as their mission of finding their new home. Littlefoot has to deal with the grief of losing his mother and the burden of loneliness as he is the most determined to find the Great Valley. Sarah is the most stubborn of the group as she slowly learns that her pride as a fearless three-horn is more of a problem than an asset. Ducky is the playful optimist. Petrie is the hyperactive comic relief that's trying to fly, and Spike is the mute and laid-back member whose top priority is to eat. Spike! <gasps> Spike! Do not stop! We must stay together! For the most part, that's all there is to them. However, they all have one thing in common that does explain their behavior and help enhance the feature to make them more likable. Their lives have just begun and are thrown into this virtually impossible mission of navigating on their own to find their families and their new home. The fact that they are children highlights their vulnerability as they go through obstacles that even adult dinosaurs don't often pass through. The only thing they got throughout this journey is each other, which may break their own laws of the land, but it's their best option to survive. And while there can be conflicts amongst each other, especially between Littlefoot and Sarah, their flaws like their stubbornness and arrogance are attributed to their young age. What the movie did best with its characters is to make the main cast feel like they are children, and their behavior is what sells that they're technically too young to go through this, but nature left them with no options. And it does help that most of the voices are from kids who actually do a solid job in their performance. Yes, I am brave. Sharptooth is dead! My father told me that Flathead had very small brains. There are a few other side characters that show up during their quest that don't really offer a whole lot to the film, but still have a notable role. These include Littlefoot's mother, who gives him the wisdom he needs for this movie, the Sharp Tooth, whom the film really plays up his threatening nature to portray him as an intimidating killing machine, and Rooter, who is the narrator of the feature and helps Littlefoot after his mother's death. Even if his appearance is quite small, I do have to ask, why is it that Rooter never shows up in any of the other Land Before Time films? He seems like the perfect wise old man trope that they could easily use for the sequels, Yet the only time he appeared was just in this one moment to help wipe a tear from the kid's face in one of the most tender scenes of the film. Seriously, where's my respect for Rooter? But she'll always be with you, as long as you remember the things she taught you. In a way, you'll never be apart. Since most of the characters are kids in a short, non-coming-of-age picture, it's not a surprise that they don't offer plenty of development to really complexify their personalities. However, for what they have, it does work to make the film emotionally moving, and the personalities that they do have are enough to make them endearing. Sure, they're just kids, but then again, that's part of why this movie still holds up. Before all the sequels and the dozens of episodes of the TV show, it was just a simple story of five young dinosaurs on a journey to a promised land. And that's all you need for a heartfelt picture. The Land Before Time is a short and sweet animated feature that prioritizes in really making you feel. Thanks to its powerful emotional core, meaningful themes, intense action, beautiful animation, charming characters, and an unforgettable score, this is a film that knows how to play with your feelings to make you cry, frightened, and cheer to become one of the most notable feel-good movies of the 1980s. Considering its under 70 minute running time, I recommend checking this out whenever you want a quick fix to make you feel something.
If you want an animated movie that's more emotional than funny, then this is a very solid choice. And if this review gave you a good feeling, then may I suggest to give this a like and subscribe to my channel? I review plenty more animated films like this that can turn out to be your next feel-good discovery, so stick around and find out what's next. Yes, this is a simple movie, but it's the best kind where it can also deliver so much, and that's why I'm giving this the Animat Seal of Approval. Even if it was set before time, it's a film that offers a feeling that can last longer than time itself. Hey guys, this is Animad, and I want to start things off by giving out a huge thanks to KSCG Guy, whose support on Patreon allowed him to get some amazing rewards, including this one, where he got to ask me to review The Land Before Time. And sure, with the fact that this is a pretty simple animated feature, and a short animated feature at that, it doesn't technically offer a whole lot in terms of quantity. But, in terms of what it does offer and what it does right, man, does that thing leave such an emotional punch. Like, it's understandable how it has such an impact on people who did watch it and who have grown up with it over the years. Like, by watching the movie, it's very understandable as to why many to this day still considers the original Land Before Time as one of Don Bluth's best animated features. So, all of this to say that, yeah, The Land Before Time truly is an emotional roller coaster. But with that said and done, I think it is now time that we shall conclude this review of The Land Before Time by moving on to our next review from the animation hat. And uh, by the way, before I go and pick the next one, I would just like to go and say that if you would like to be like a KSCG guy, and you want to go and get some amazing rewards, uh, including, but not limited to uh, watching my videos before anyone else, while also su uh, supporting my work at the same time, then all you have to do is go to patreon.com slash animat. But at the same time, if you would like to suggest an animated film you would like me to review and that I would put onto the animation hat, then all you have to do is write me an email at animatsreviews at gmail.com. All right, so let's see what our next one will have in store for us. So, oh, okay, uh, just managed to grab one right here. So the next review shall be... Oh, oh, okay. Oh my God, you know what? You know what? This is something that I've wanted to watch for like a long time, but I never really got the chance to actually go and see it myself. And it's one of those that honestly I should because uh, this is one of the more independent animated features uh, that has received a lot of praise over the years. Uh, one in which that actually did get nominated for an Oscar for Best Animated Feature. And uh, well, honestly, I don't know what else to say about it. Maybe the the song might be a little bit of a clue, but um, you know what? I'm ready to go and check this movie out. And uh, why is it that even as an independent animated feature, it still has millions of people falling in love with it, so much so that it even got a sequel? I mean, what other indie animated film could go and have uh, that title? Okay, maybe several of them, but uh, well, this is one of them. <laughs> 